So this is Python for OSINT tooling with Emily Chance. Emily Chance is a consultant in the Los Angeles area. She provides OSINT services to small and medium businesses and private clients for the purpose of for, for the purpose of doing risk and security assessments. In her spare time, she hangs out with her two dogs, Kirby and Qbert, and reads a lot of books about everything she can. Please welcome Emily to ShellCon 2018. Hello. Uh, so first off, a brief announcement. I am just recovering from a small cold. Uh, so forgive me if I have to step away from the mic a bit uh, to cough. I don't want to uh, blow anyone's eardrums out with loud coughing. Uh, so this is my uh, talk, Python for OSINT. Uh, it is about automating your open source intelligence gathering using a few Python libraries that I have found useful. Um, about me, like uh, Wedgie said, I am a consultant in the Los Angeles area. A lot of what I do uh, in the OSINT space is gathering uh, open source intelligence for either small to medium businesses or private clients, uh, which usually just means wealthy individuals, uh, for the purpose of doing risk assessments or uh, other types of security assessments. Uh, I am a self-taught Python developer. Uh, I don't write a lot of Python on a day-to-day -day basis. Most of what I do uh, is write a tool, leave it until it needs to be fixed, and then work on it some more. If I spend, you know, four hours a week writing Python, it's a good week. Uh, so some of this code is going to be a little kludgy and not super professional, um, but it doesn't have to be for what I need it to do. Uh, I am a DEF CON 562 member. We're the local DEF CON group uh, out of Long Beach, uh, and they are also running the CTF this year. Uh, so check them out if you're looking for a space to you know, try to connect with your local in InfoSec community. Uh, I can be found online at uh, G underscore Solaria on Twitter. So if you want to get in touch with me, uh, that's a good way to do it. Um, I am also, as Wedgie said, a dog mom to Kirby and Qbert. My babies, uh, they are probably my favorite things in the world outside of, uh, well, just my favorite things in the world. So uh, I do have a co-author for this talk. Her name is Eilet Glazer. She is based in France, so she was not able to be here today. Uh, but she is a freelance Python developer, and uh, she does a lot of database uh, DBA stuff as well. Uh, she has about 10 years of focus on making scientific research tools and currently focuses on making tools for small teams and researchers as well. Uh, at one point in time, I gave her uh, the tool that I'm, I'm open sourcing with this talk. Uh, it was a sort of clutched together group of Python scripts, and she sat down and instead of giving me some advice on it, uh, took a lot of my code and rewrote it to be far more elegant. Um, so she is the co-author on this talk because she has a lot of contributions to the code that you're going to see, especially at the end. Uh, she is a cat mom to uh, two lovely cats named Squeaker and Potato. Uh, they are absolutely wonderful kitties. Uh, I wish I had photos of them, but she didn't have any good photos. The purpose of this talk is to cover several uh, open source intel or several Python libraries that can be used to automate open source intelligence gathering. Uh, this talk assumes that you have some familiarity with both the process of open source intelligence gathering and also with writing Python. However, if you don't have experience with those things, uh, definitely feel free to stick around. I recommend getting experience with both those things. If you are you know, working in the InfoSec space, they're both very useful. And as you start to learn more about those things, even if you don't know much about it now, there will be things from this talk that will pop up in your head as you start learning those things and you'll say, hey, I remember this. Um, we're gonna walk through some libraries and show examples of programs that can use them. Unfortunately, it seems like the, the actual code examples that are gonna be up on the screen aren't going to show up very well based on the, the, the first slide. Um, so if you want to look at them uh, while we're going through them, they can be found at this GitHub link. Uh, it's just github.com slash g dash shellaria slash shellcon 2018. Uh, ooh, mimosas have arrived. Thank you, fun size. Uh, two of them, oh Lord. That's gonna be a problem. You're welcome. Um, 
Thank you very much. So uh, all of these programs are written in Python 3 as the good Lord intended. Uh, some of the code examples here may not give incredibly useful results. So if you're running them along with me, um, you may think this isn't super useful. That's because they're sort of pared down to demonstrate one specific context or one specific use. Um, at the end, we're gonna be looking at the, the rewritten program that Aylet made called Zonitor, and that is going to glue all of these together in a way that is much more useful. So if you're looking at some of this and saying, this is only doing one little thing, what's the use of this? Probably nothing, but it'll become apparent when you add it together with all of the other things. Uh, the libraries that we're gonna be covering are the Google Custom Search API library, Beautiful Soup, uh, the Google Cloud Language API library, a library called Fuzzy Wuzzy, and Selenium. So let's go ahead and dive in. Uh, the first thing we're gonna talk about is the Google Custom Search API. Uh, Google provides the ability to create a custom search engine. Usually their, their thinking behind this is that you're going to take that custom search engine and stick it on your website and use it to search your website or uh, one or two websites that are associated. Um, it's restrictive because we can only look at the domains that we've specified when we are creating the CSE. However, there's a workaround that you can go back in and delete the domains that you've added. And at that point, you're basically just searching all of Google with this API. Uh, to create this, you just go to the CSE website. Uh, you click add, fill out the information, click create, and then go to the control panel and delete your, uh, the domains that you specified at the beginning. Now you have, like I said, an API for searching all of Google. Um, there is a cost to this. It is 100 searches per day for free. After that, it's $5 per thousand searches, up to 10,000 a day. If you're getting up to the point of doing 10,000 searches a day, chances are you're probably doing something for work and they should be giving you the ability to you know, use their billing account. If you're not, however, uh, the Google Cloud billing account will give you $300 in free credit every time you create a new account. So if you find yourself running into the limits where you're actually costing yourself money, uh, just create new accounts and switch out the API key and the CSE ID and you've got $300. Um, you can install the library using pip, uh, the command is right there. Um, that is the best way, in my opinion, to uh, install that. Um, so this is the code that, like I said, is not super visible here and I'm sorry about that. Um, what we're interested in is the, uh, the function on line 25 and the for loop on line 35. The rest of this is just things that have been added in to actually make this functional. Um, but what we're doing here is we are actually taking the, uh, well, we're importing the library, the Google API client dot discovery. Uh, you're importing build from that. And then you're going to go ahead and uh, on line 26 here, um, you tell it to go ahead and build the service using uh, custom search, which specifies what API you're gonna hit, the version one, uh, and then you give it the API key for your account. Uh, on line 27, you go ahead and actually tell it to execute that by doing uh, service.cse.list. You give it a search term, you give it this custom search uh, engine ID, which is the other thing that you get from them when you create this. Uh, and then it does take some keyword arguments and tell it to execute. Um, once you have that built, you can take that function and create a query list, which in my case, what I'm doing is I'm taking a list of websites and a list of keywords that I wanna use. I am creating a, you know, reading the both of those into memory, creating a list for both of those, combining those as queries, and then just running them through that custom search API to get results back from this. Uh, this will give you back, uh, this specific thing will give you back the 10 top results for each domain that you feed it. Um, and at this point, you've got a list of however many results from Google that you want for the primary keyword in your list. 
um, once we move on, we'll see that we can actually start taking that information and feeding it into other libraries or other functions to do interesting things with it. But this just gets us our initial results list. The next thing that we're going to take a look at here is Beautiful Soup. Uh, Beautiful Soup is a really useful HTML parsing library. So you've got this list of results from the Google API, uh, but you can't really do a whole lot with that unless you start parsing it. Uh, parsing HTML using Python is somewhat difficult if you try to do it using uh, like regular expressions or anything like that. You will find very quickly that it doesn't really give you the results that you want, and you're going to be fighting with a lot of, you know, the, the structure of the HTML itself. Um, so Beautiful Soup will create a Beautiful Soup object, and it maintains the structure of the page, uh, can be worked with in multiple ways. It allows you to select portions of text from the page based on things like the tags, the classes. Uh, you can even actually use the find all and find uh, attributes to locate specific words or specific phrases. So if you want to, uh, and this is where regular expressions will come in uh, handy, you can actually give it a regular expression and tell it, find these within the page, and it will handle all of the, you know, I want to find it in the body, I want to find this in, uh, you know, any H1 tags, I want to find this in these particular areas, as opposed to just trying to use uh, regex itself, uh, which it gets fairly complicated. Um, once again, easy to install using pip. Uh, so this is the specific code using uh, Beautiful Soup. What you're going to do is you're just going to uh, say, uh, you know, create the Beautiful Soup object, uh, which is we're looking at that on line, uh, where is this? This may be the wrong file, unfortunately. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to say, OK, we have a result here. Uh, usually, uh, you can use either the URL lib library or I use results, which is a, a separate library. You would just say, you know, for this result, uh, go ahead and request that, get that page, download it, and then take that and turn it into a beautiful soup object. At which point, once you've turned it into a beautiful soup object, you can then do things like going through and finding all of the specific words for the keywords that we mentioned earlier in the keyword list. So you would just say, OK, uh, our search word that we want to look for, the keyword that we want to look for, is the first word in our keyword list. We're going to go ahead and say that uh, the list of keywords is HTML soup dot body dot find all, and then you just feed it the arguments that you want it to have. Uh, in this case, we're saying, um, you know, we're using a, a regex to format the search word, finding that within the thing uh, that we've grabbed, and returning that to us. Um, once we have that, we can go ahead and start saying, okay, how many times does this word occur on the page? That can be useful sometimes for prioritization. So say you have a list of results from your custom search API and you want to figure out which of these are most relevant to me. Uh, one of the things that I often do uh, as opposed to, you know, OSINT for uh, things like, you know, pen tests or uh, that kind of thing is working with clients who want to see what type of information about them is out there and then figure out how to remediate some of that if they're worried about, you know, this specific thing is out there. So using this as a prioritization scheme allows you to go ahead and say, okay, we're going to focus on which of these results has the highest concentration of the primary keyword and then the other keywords that we've put in our keyword file. And that'll allow us to say, okay, we need to focus on this first as, as a, a priority in our remediations. The next place to go with this is the Google Cloud Language API. Uh, it can be created on the same Google Cloud billing account as the custom search engine. So once again, you get that $300 to you know, offset the cost of actually hitting the API there. Um, also, it's installed via PIP. 
the uh, library itself is just google-cloud-language. This is slightly different in terms of how you actually do the credentials. Uh, it will give you a, a JSON file containing that uh, credentials. You have to export that to your environment variables. Um, there are other ways to do it, but I've found that this is the easiest one, especially if you're running it on something that isn't gonna be rebooting frequently. Uh, this allows for analysis of entities, it allows for analysis of the sentiment of the overall document, and it also allows you to analyze the sentiment towards specific entities that you find. Uh, so one of the things that you can do is go ahead and take the beautiful soup object that we created in the last, uh, the last slide there. Um, you pull out whatever text you want from that, whether that's the body, whether that's the headers, whether it's all of the text, and then you go ahead and you feed it into the Cloud Language API. Now, the Cloud Language API has a few different ways of getting the information that you want it. Uh, you can feed it raw text, uh, plain text. You can also, if you are working within uh, the actual Google Cloud, uh, it will allow you to access content that is stored on their cloud just using the URL. So instead of having to pull the beautiful soup object, pull out the text and feed it in, you can just say, okay, access this resource that's stored on the Google Cloud Platform. Um, I am not using the Google Cloud Platform, so I'm not doing that here. That is another way of getting the resources that you want into the, uh, the Cloud API. So what we've done here is we've gone ahead and we've created our, our client, which is the language.language language, language service client. We've given it the document, which is the document that you're going to be feeding it. Uh, and then we have uh, declared what our response is going to be as well. Uh, we want to analyze the sentiment of this document. At that point, you go ahead and uh, take your list of results. Once again, you're going to pull down the results, create a beautiful soup object with it, pull out the body text, and then go ahead and feed it back into this function that we've created that will get the actual object uh, get the actual sentiments for you, print out the sentiment scores. So this is going to be useful in situations for me, once again, where we're not necessarily dealing with, uh, I'm doing, you know, intelligence gathering for a pen test, but say you have a client who is concerned about uh, information that is out there and wants to monitor how people are feeling about them personally, how people are feeling about their company, how people are feeling about a product that they're about to release. Uh, this will Will allow you to go ahead and take a bunch of results, feed it through, and get back uh, an analysis of you know what are people talking about, what are they feeling about it, uh, if they're talking about other companies alongside of your company. So you know you're a company and you want to figure out what other companies are being talked about in comparison to you. Uh, this is one way that you can go ahead and automate that kind of thing. Uh, so now we're going to move on to Fuzzy Wuzzy. Fuzzy Wuzzy is a library that allows you to do uh, edit distance comparis comparisons. Specifically, it's using uh, the Levenstein distance formula. Um, this is useful if you've got a situation where you have a page that certain keywords are misspelled or abbreviated or uh, anything like that. You can tell it, okay, I also want to find keywords in this page that are you know, similar to my keyword, but not exactly my keyword. Maybe somebody abbreviated it, maybe somebody misspelled it, but we don't want to miss those because those are still going to be useful to us. Those still want to be added into things like a priority score, et cetera. Um, Fuzzy Wuzzy can be installed, uh, once again, using pip. I recommend using the speed up option, which also will install the python levenstein uh, package, and that speeds it up significantly in terms of how quickly it does those edit distance comparisons. So here we've got, uh, and I feel bad that this code is so small because, uh, once again, you can't see it perfectly well, but it is available online if you want to go look at it later. Um, here we've basically just got something that's, again, using the Cloud Language API to pull out all of the entities and then running it through Fuzzy Wuzzy to say how many entities are on this page that also match 
our keywords that we feed it, it that we fed it uh, with a 90% ratio. So an edit distance ratio of 90% or 90, excuse me. Um, and that will give you pages that are, you know, or, or results that are similar and relevant and still allow you to say, okay, you know, we've got this, this page. Uh, it might not have our keywords spelled correctly across it on the whole thing, but we can also take those misspelled keywords, those abbreviated keywords, uh, anything that, you know, we still would want to have show up in our results and go ahead and, uh, you know, take those as well. Um, we're again starting to build on each library using the Google Cloud Language API and using Beautiful Soup here to actually get the text that we're feeding it. There are different ways of implementing this as well. Obviously, like I said, you could use these, uh, you, could, you could store some of the things that you're looking at in the Google Cloud platform, um, but here we're using the request.git um, to actually pull the page down, uh, which slows it down a little bit, but not significantly enough uh, that it's a problem. Um, the last library that we're gonna talk about here is Selenium. Um, Selenium emulates a web browser. And if you have situations where you want to monitor things on websites where you would need to log in, Selenium is really, really useful. Uh, it allows you to pass credentials and store cookies, things of that nature. So say you're working on uh, a project where you want to monitor the sentiment or the, you know, the, the feeling that people are having of a specific product that's being released. You want to look at tech websites that that are talking about this. So, you know, certain Reddit subreddits, Hacker News, uh, you know, tech news sites like Wired or, uh, you know, motherboard.vice, you could uh, sometimes run into situations where you're going to have a paywall or you're going to need to log in to get to certain places. Um, you know, if you've got subreddits that are private that you want to monitor, uh, say you want to monitor major news websites like New York Times, well, they're only going to give you five articles a month, and Selenium is still going to run into that if you don't feed it credentials, but you have the option to feed it credentials, and that makes it significantly more useful for being able to gather information from places where there are paywalls, you know, required logins, that kind of thing. Um, and you can also use it using headless Chrome, uh, which is super useful because then you don't have to actually have the browser in front of you. Uh, you can feed it different user agents using uh, a couple different libraries that are available for that uh, that are a little outside the scope of this. Uh, but there are several ways to work with this that can automate uh, the things that you would need a browser to do. Uh, so here we've got uh, some code that's using Selenium. Uh, you're just going to go ahead and tell it what driver you want to use. Uh, I'm using the Chrome driver because I'm using headless Chrome here. So you give it the binary location. Uh, you tell it, you know, these are the options I want to use. Uh, you specify in this case that it's headless. And then you go ahead and you actually create the driver, which is going to be the thing that you use to grab the results. Um, you say, you know, use that driver to get, in this case, we're using Facebook. Um, Facebook has a, a, a really interesting list, and I talked about this last year uh, in my talk about uh, OSINT for red teaming. Python has a real, or excuse me, Facebook has a really interesting list of ways to search content on people's pages. Um, you can get things like all of the events that they have attended, all of their, uh, you know, all of the places they've checked in, all of the posts that they've been tagged in, just by accessing a specific URL using their profile ID. Um, so this is, this still has a few bugs in it that need to be worked out, but basically what this does is it takes the profile ID for a specific Facebook account, goes through, logs into Facebook, grabs all of those pages, opens them all up, takes a screenshot and saves it, which is super useful if you're doing OSINT on a specific individual and you want to get all of this information uh, without having to go through each of those pages. So this brings us to the 
sort of putting together of all of these. Uh, it's a program called Zonitor. Um, this is also, uh, I forgot to put the repo URL in there, I apologize, but it's on my GitHub. So if you just look at the repos on uh, the same GitHub that the slides and the other code is on, you'll see it, it's a separate repo. Zonitor is the program that uh, Aylit wrote when I went and gave her a bunch of scripts and asked her, hey, can you help me work out some bugs in this? Instead of working out some bugs in it, she basically got bored and rewrote it in a weekend. Uh, which is something that she tends to do, uh, and I didn't mind because what she wrote was a lot more uh, interesting and useful. Um, once again, it allows you to take a list of websites and a list of keywords and specify what keyword you want to, uh, you know, what keyword you want to search as your primary keyword, and then the websites that you want to search that across. Um, it uses the custom search engine to find the results. And then it, go, it goes and takes the cloud language API to find entity sentiments, and it uses keyword weighting. So instead of the somewhat uh, you know, hacky solution that I had earlier of just finding the number of times that the keyword apply is in a, or appears in a page and then dividing that based on how much I want that keyword to weight, this actually has a specific keyword weighting option. She's used a library called Config Parser, which is also outside the scope of this talk, um, but it allows you to create a, a options file and a target file that will say, you know, okay, I want this keyword weighted at this. This is how I want to weight the keywords, you know, based on their priorities, things like that. Uh, and it will uh, allow you to monitor results and assign them priorities based on the keyword concentration and the entities that exist. And then it will also get the entity sentiments and the overall sentiment analysis for the document that you feed it. Um, one of the things that I have been using this for since she went ahead and, and gave this to me uh, was using it as a cron job to monitor results consistently. So if I have a client who says, I'm releasing XYZ product, I want to know how people feel about it, and I want to know how people, are, how, how people are feeling about it over time. I want to know if people's feelings about it change as they start using it more regularly. Uh, say we have a client, uh, specifically, for instance, I have a client who has been subject to uh, a pretty pernicious um, individual who's trying to hurt her reputation by constantly releasing a revenge porn video of her. So using this script, we're able to you know, find that video when it pops up because they use the same keywords. And then we're also able to monitor certain places where this is talked about to look at how people are responding to this being released. Are people you know, sympathetic with her? Are people saying you know, things about her that are, are sort of indicative of her reputation being harmed negatively? Because we want to store all of this so that if and when the individual who's responsible for this uh, you know, is able to be taken to court. Unfortunately, at this point, we don't have enough evidence to specifically uh, do that. But if and when we can take him to court, we can use this and say, look, this is how this has actually concretely hurt her reputation over time. We can say, over time, we can see that this specific forum was discussing her and the sentiment analysis was positive. And as these videos continue to be released and posted on different forums, the sentiment analysis in this specific place shows that her reputation was actually harmed. Um, so I went ahead and uh, did just a very broad um, you know, use of this. Uh, let's say we're looking at how people in Seattle feel about the idea of Amazon and specifically how they feel about the idea of Amazon unionizing. Uh, we're gonna look across, once again, just some very broad websites. Uh, obviously some large news websites, but then also some websites specific to uh, publishing news for the Seattle area. What we get 
in the end is a uh, CSV that gives us all of these results and then their priority score. So we can see, uh, you know, we've got the, the seattlepie.com. That's going to be the highest priority because it contains the most of our keywords. And so we look at that and we say, okay, this is an article we should definitely look at in terms of seeing how people are feeling about the idea of Amazon and Amazon employees unionizing within the Seattle area. Uh, and then it goes on. This, when the uh, CSV initially is exported uh, or, or is saved, um, this is not sorted, but it's really easy to just say sort based on the value in the priority column. And then you can look at that and say, these are the ones that we need to work with. These are very broad results because once again, we're using a very broad subject here and Jeff Bezos and Amazon is something that's talked about very broadly. But if you're using this for a smaller situation, a smaller company, uh, things like that, there are other ways that you could use this. You could use this to look for things like sensitive keywords for uh, company projects being posted on various websites that you think might you know, might have that information. Uh, if you were wanting to say, look for credential leaks for your company, you could use this to go and look at the various pastebin websites where oftentimes people would paste credential leaks and then monitor for specific keywords, whether that be your company name, uh, the actual usernames of certain individuals within your organization, things like that, and then obviously get a priority based on, you know, okay, this has a lot of of our keywords, this looks like it could be an information leak or a credential leak or something of that that basis. Um, once again, in my situation, if I've got clients who are wanting to know, you know, how are people, where are people talking about me related to these specific subjects, this would give me the opportunity to say, okay, let's put, you know, the client name is the main keyword, and then those subjects that they're looking for, here are the 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 places where that's being talked about. Here are the highest priority uh, places with where that's being talked about. These are the places that we need to worry about triaging for one reason or another. And then it also is going to give you the sentiment analysis for the keyword that you, uh, that it finds most frequently in that. <coughs> Excuse me. So once again, we've got, uh, you know, Amazon is a fairly frequent keyword. Um, you can, again, sort this document based on the sentiment uh, or the magnitude score, um, which will allow you to see, you know, how, how positive or how negative is this sentiment. Is this sentiment overwhelmingly good? Maybe we don't care about the overwhelmingly good ones. Maybe we want to look at the ones at the bottom where the sentiment is overwhelmingly negative. And so the sentiment score is going to tell you this is positive, this is negative. The magnitude score is going to tell you it's overwhelmingly one or the other, or maybe it's just in the middle. Maybe it's not very overwhelmingly positive or negative at all. Maybe it's just sort of slightly off neutral one way or the other. And that's going to be able to tell you where you need to look if you're looking for things like like, you know, negative discussions of a company, negative discussions of an individual, um, you know, and, and if you're trying to triage those, uh, you know, say you're in PR or something of that nature, you've released a product, you see uh, there are some places out there where there are negative discussions about your product, this will allow you to automate pulling all of that up uh, and looking at the results that need to be specifically uh, taken care of to begin with. Um, so obviously, once again, this, the potential uses, um, monitor the online sentiment of a person, a product, or an event. Um, you can, once again, look at monitoring for potential data leaks, uh, and then just automate portions of ongoing OSINT. And honestly, I'm sure that there are uses out there that I haven't even considered or thought of. Uh, if anybody has any that they are immediately thinking, hey, this could be useful for this, um, I'd love to hear about it, because I'm sure that there are other places where this could be useful. Uh, there's a few to-dos for Zonitor, um, and we would love to get community contributions on this. We are open sourcing it, uh, so we want people to go ahead and give us feedback, use it, find bugs, file issues, file, you know, uh, submit pull requests. We will definitely take those seriously. Uh, one of the things that we need to do right off the bat is we need to implement Selenium support so that it can do those things like logging into websites, handling credentials, handling cookies. Um, that's a 
fairly difficult, not fairly difficult, but fairly time intensive process so that is one of the things that is left to do and then also we're working on setting it up to track results across time and actually be able to graph out things like changes in sentiment uh, so that if you need to look at that kind of thing um, it's easily available and easily visualized for you as opposed to having to go and say let's look at each individual output document and see how the sentiment has changed manually. Um, so those are some of the things that we're still working on doing. If anybody, you know, has the itch to go ahead and, uh, you know, work on that with us, we definitely welcome those community contributions. Uh, so I am kind of sped through this, so I'm done a little early, but are there any questions? Okay. No, it is making the connection directly from your computer to the the uh, result that you're wanting to to access. Uh, the question was: Is the the Selenium uh, implementation is it using a server or 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 not? Yeah, so the uh, the API keys from Google. Uh, the keys associated with our own uh, Google account or it comes with like a general one to yeah. So those are associated with your own account. Uh, the key, the, the question was uh, where you get the API keys, if those are something that are out there, uh, you know, for everyone to use or if you have to have your own account. The keys are associated with a Google Cloud billing account, um, which is where you, uh, you get the keys both for the Cloud Language API and the Custom Search API. Um, both of those, once again, like I said, will give you $300 in credit to begin with, so that's why it's, it's useful to have your own account because um, you can you know, easily just recreate those accounts and, and get yourself more credit on that. <coughs> Any other questions? Go ahead. Is there a, when you're doing these searches, is, is Google also tracking what you're searching and making correlations there behind the scenes? Yeah. So because you're running the searches through Google, it is going to be tracking that. Um, there are instances where I don't want that to be the case, and so I've written uh, some other web scrapers that don't use Google specifically um, that will look at specific pages and then crawl out and find the links off those pages and actually create its own, you know, sort of index of domains that it's looking at. Um, but those I'm not, I'm not ready or willing to open source because they're just too uh, proprietary to my specific process. Best to add like Bing and stuff, right? Absolutely. Yeah, you could definitely do that, and we would definitely welcome that. Uh, you know, there are several other search engines that have APIs that you can hit um, that would, you know, do similar things and, and allow you to get even more data in terms of, you know, how things are, are ranked and things like that, so. not worked with law enforcement uh, specifically with this program. I have done some work with law enforcement um, on a few different things, uh, but this has come about sort of since that, uh, that work was done. So no, uh, but I could actually see how that could be useful, um, that you know, th there would be places where that would be applicable. I have built it specifically for monitoring specific domain names, but you could definitely take it and rip that portion out and just have it be doing searches you know, through Google.com. Right now, the, uh, the way it builds the query is you know, using site colon domain name space keyword. Um, 
but you don't have to do it that way. I did it that way because a lot of times the things that I am looking at, I want to be looking at specific websites because we know that those are the places that certain things need to be monitored consistently. Usually this is based on the results of having done some manual open source intelligence gathering and then finding things that we need to consistently monitor and keep uh, you know, a close eye on, but you don't have to do it that way. You could easily rip that portion out uh, if you wanted to fork it and, you know, make your own version that doesn't use the, you know, the, the domain argument. Um, no, you don't have to do that at all. Go ahead. Is it for investing? No. Your company reputations? Uh, you probably could. I haven't thought about doing that way. Um, I don't really play the stock market. Um, I have my little IRA that I contribute to, and that's about all I do. But uh, you probably could use it for that. Um, you know, feed it a list of the common websites that you would look at for that kind of thing, and then you know get get back that sentiment analysis and whatnot. I have recommended uh, the cloud language API to a friend who does uh, do investing and you know wants to sort of build something to to do uh, specifically looking at that kind of thing. Um, so that is a place where you know that library specifically and and you know maybe this in general would be useful. Any other questions? All right, well, I'll go ahead and finish up early then. Um, that gives you guys time to run and get unlimited mimosas still, I believe, because they're available till 11. So thank you all for coming.